As destructive as they are in their nature, volcanic eruptions influenced and shaped the Earth we know today. From the landscape, all the way to the many amazing forms of life that call it home. In fact, undersea volcanic hot springs may just be the location where the very first forms of life began. In our last episode, we covered the largest class of volcanic eruptions, the magmatic type, which is the class most commonly thought of when the phrase volcanic eruption is uttered. The link to this video is in the description box down below and is worth watching if you haven't already seen it. In this video, we're diving into the phreatomagmatic and phreatic forms of volcanic eruptions. Just like in the magmatic class, there exists the potential for deadly and powerful eruptions to occur in these two classes. Unlike the magmatic type, however, a certain factor is required for both eruptive types that, if not present, makes it impossible for them to occur. This shared necessity is the involvement of water. The difference between the two classes is held in how the water itself interacts with the volcanic magma chamber. So let's dive into this difference. Phreatomagmatic eruptions. Phreatomagmatic eruptions occur as a result of a direct interaction between magma and water. When water comes into contact with magma, it is instantly superheated. The sudden large difference in temperature between the two causes explosive and violent water-magma interactions. Unlike the function of thermal expansion that is utilized by the magmatic class, phreatomagmatic eruptions rely instead on thermal contraction, which is the shrinking of substances as they cool, meaning the length, size, and volume of a substance decreases as it gets cooled. In thermal expansion, those properties just listed expand as the substance gains heat. But another factor is thought to be involved. That factor being fuel coolant reactions, which are steam explosions that occur by the sudden boiling of water into steam instantly upon contact with magma. A demonstration of this can be found when cold water contacts a very hot surface, such as what is seen when a few drops of cold water fall onto an already hot pan. This creates a mini explosion as the water converts to steam instantaneously upon contact with the hot pan. I don't endorse trying this out as it's quite dangerous. This demonstration, when expanded to the scenario of a large volcanic magma chamber suddenly contacting sea or groundwater, gives us a valuable insight into how violent and massive these eruptions could be. Volcanologists are still uncertain whether both fuel coolant reactions and thermal contraction are responsible for these types of eruptions, or if it's one or the other. My personal hypothesis is phreatomagmatic eruptions are a result of both. Phreatic eruptions. Phreatic eruptions are steam-driven explosions, and the class itself contains only one type of eruption. The defining difference of phreatic eruptions lies in the fact they occur when water contacts superheated rocks located around a magma chamber instead of the magma itself. The water is superheated into steam upon contact with the magma chamber's surrounding rocks, and that triggers the eruption, which produces a steam and ash explosion, and releases any debris present above the point of the explosion. Above is the defining word here, and is why there is normally no new magma present during phreatic eruptions. Anything above where the reaction occurs is what is erupted, rather than what is in the magma chamber itself. In phreatomagmatic and magmatic eruptive types, new magma from deep within the earth is erupted to the surface, whereas lava is barely ever associated with phreatic eruptions, which normally only blast out pre-existing solid rock. The strength of the rock is a defining factor in whether or not a phreatic eruption will occur. Rocks that are strong enough to withstand the force exerted delay the eruption. However, over time, this rock is normally weakened due to cracks that are formed from past phreatic reactions, which eventually deteriorate the rock to the point it shatters and makes way for a phreatic eruption to occur. Though normally small in size, Phreatic eruptions can actually be quite dangerous. They can release hazardous pyroclastic surges, lahar flows, can cause avalanches to occur, and can also create volcanic block rain, a phenomenon that occurs when fragments of rock above 64 millimeters in diameter, or 2.5 inches, 
are erupted in its solid state. These can be very large in size. A past eruption of Mount Vesuvius in Italy saw 2-3 to three ton blocks becoming airborne and flying 100-200 to 200 meters in distance from the volcano before finally crashing down upon the surface. The difference between volcanic blocks and volcanic bombs is the latter is present in its molten state and the former in its solid state. On top of this, high concentrations of toxic gas in the form of hydrogen sulfide or carbon dioxide can also be released and is able to fatally suffocate any life close enough to an active eruption. One eruption in 1979 led to the end of 140 ill-fated lives on the island of Java during a phreatic eruption. Post-eruption, the formation of broad, low-relief craters called Mars are very commonly built following a phreatic or a phreatomagmatic eruption. Phreatic eruptions also serve as a precursor to future volcanic activity for other eruptive classes. Though generally weak, there have been some very strong exceptions. The 1883 eruption of Krakatoa, which obliterated most of the volcanic island and created the loudest sound in recorded history, is believed to have been triggered by a phreatic event. The notorious 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens gave warning of an imminent eruption in the form of numerous phreatic events, occurring just prior to the massive magmatic eruption blowing out the side of the volcano, creating the most incredible landslide ever recorded on video thus far, in my opinion. So to sum it up, phreatomagmatic eruptions require magma and water contacting each other directly and release new magma upon the surface that has journeyed from deep within the earth. Phreatic eruptions don't consist of a direct water-magma interaction, occurring instead when water and hot rocks meet, which superheats the water, creating explosions that forcefully propel rocks located above the eruption towards the surface in an outburst of ash, steam and debris. Now that we know the difference, let's move on to the three phreatomagmatic eruption types. Phreatomagmatic eruption type 1, Sertsian eruptions. Sertsian eruptions consist of shallow water interacting with lava. It's named after the famous 1963 eruption and formation of the island of Sertsi off the coast of Iceland. These eruptions are not confined to existing solely within the sea and can occur on land when rising magma comes into contact with groundwater or seawater at shallow levels under the volcano. The rock type generally fueling these eruptions is basalt and sometimes, though quite rarely, andesite. They are comparable to the magmatic Strombolian eruption type and are often described as the wet equivalent, with both types sharing the continuous or rhythmic style of eruptions. Unlike Strombolian eruptions, however, the inclusion of water means the explosivity is much more larger, with very violent steam explosions that fragment magma, turning it into a fine-grained ash. A defining feature of these eruptions is the formation of pyroclastic surges, a ground-hugging radial cloud that forms when the eruption column is released, fatally enveloping any life that it comes across. Like phreatic eruptions, these eruptions tend to form Mars. They can also form circular structures called tuff rings, a semicircular cone created by the combination of water and high amounts of flowing lava that breach in the direction of the lava flow that created them. Phreatomagmatic eruption type 2, submarine eruptions. Occurring strictly underwater, the majority of submarine eruptions take place at subduction zones and constructive margins. These eruptions are associated with the formation of seamounts and pillow lavas. Pillow lavas, as the name suggests, are lava flows that contain the characteristic shape of a pillow. Generally, these fluid lava flows are basaltic in nature, however it can also consist of dacite, andesite, and even rhyolite rocks, which create pillow lavas much larger in size due to a higher silica level and the associated viscosity produced by that. Pyroclastic activity can most definitely occur with this eruptive type, predominantly during the collapses of a caldera mid-eruption. This eruptive style sees a great deal of deviation within each eruption. Some variables that can change the course of one eruption from another include magma viscosity, the volatile content, 
The water depth it occurs at due to the pressure exerted at deeper levels within the ocean, and of course, the rock type. The difference between these eruptions and Sertsian eruptions is the depth and the fact it occurs strictly underwater. Phreatomagmatic Eruption Type 3 Subglacial Eruptions Characterized by a lava and ice interaction that often occurs underneath a glacier, subglacial eruptions, when not actively erupting, are hard at work producing another phenomenon just as deadly as an active eruption itself. The heat produced by the magma chamber melts the surrounding ice, producing an accumulation of meltwater. When an eruption occurs, this meltwater can create two very dangerous events, lahars and a glacial run. Lahars occur when water and tephra mix, producing hazardous lahar flows. A glacial run, on the other hand, arises when a glacial dam lake burst occurs, which releases massive amounts of water, creating a dangerously fast-flowing flash flood. Alongside this, the risk of a massive landslide due to glacial destabilization is a possibility. This eruption type is thought to be responsible for the many unusual, flat-topped, steep-sided volcanoes seen in Iceland, referred to as tuyas. So now we're going to look at what happens when these three eruptive classes cross over with each other. A purely magmatic volcano that might have generated a good level of pressure, but not enough to erupt on its own, could be ushered into an earlier eruption if water suddenly makes contact with magma due to the violent reaction that follows. In terms of phreatic activity, the explosions and cracking of rocks can work to excel eruptions of both magmatic and phreatomagmatic classes by weakening the rocks surrounding the magma chamber, which works to lower the overall level of pressure needed to shatter and break through them, culminating in an earlier eruption than what would have otherwise occurred. Some of the largest volcanic eruptions in history have been a result of water suddenly contacting a magmatic volcano and producing an enormous phreatomagmatic eruption. The Campi Flegre supervolcano in Italy is one example of this. Massive tsunamis were created due to it being located in a shallow bay. So to sum it up, there are three different types of phreatomagmatic eruptions. The Sertsian, submarine and subglacial eruptive types and there is only one phreatic eruption style. Water is the key factor in both of these classes. It directly contacts magma to form phreatomagmatic eruptions, and it contacts superheated rocks around the magma chamber to form phreatic eruptions. Well, that sums up part two of this series. I hope you enjoyed this and learned a few things. If you did, please like, subscribe, and share this video around. It really helps the channel out. I've just started using Instagram again, so consider following my account to get a hint at future videos and content. The link to this will be in the description box down below. Thank you for watching, I'll see you all real soon.